So part of our conversation will look at interinstitutional collaboration as existed, but most of it, uh, the direction of uh, our president, Vicky Strike, we will look at building the future, things we are putting in place uh, to uh, take interinstitutional collaboration in the next year or the next five years. Five years. Um, I'll also sort of frame at the beginning of this, there's been a lot of conversation with the conference about uh, partnerships that primarily center around audience engagement. That's not primarily what we're talking about today. Certainly, I think there will be time in the audience question portion of that, and I think most of us can speak to that. Um, so, uh, I'll just introduce our first panelist, Sean LeCount, uh, Artistic Director of Company One. Uh, just make a sound if you are part of Sean's posse. There are, <laughs> there are so many of them here. <laughs> Sean, uh, of course, is the artist director and has directed regional premieres of countless plays, including uh, Annie Baker's The Book, uh, Annie Baker's The Aliens, uh, the world premiere of Kirsten Greenwich's Splendor, and uh, Blue's Love Death Book. Charles is going to ask us one question for the entire panel that both of us will answer, and then we will <laughs> directly into the panel. Each other. Uh, so, the first thing I wanted to do was just uh, introduce the panel by talking about an interinstitutional collaboration very briefly in just three or four minutes that can then be a launching board for some of the questions we want to explore today. Um,
So we went to the Ames Hotel, or the, it was the Morgan Hotel, um, and they are a boutique hotel that has a history of doing strange, sexy things in the woods. Um, uh, we didn't know that, but we found out that like they had like private little concerts with like uh, I don't know, like weird little bands, but like well, they're really big bands actually. But we are strange that they had them in these tiny little hotel rooms. Um, so they had all these kind of strange artistic relationships. They're a hotel that apparently a chain of hotels that apparently are um, invested in us. So the truth is, they had it really easy. Uh, basically, we went to a suite there for a very long time and ran this um, really strange little play. Uh, and it was, you know, we ran it a couple times a day and they had all kinds of characters coming in. Um, and all they wanted to do was make it right. So we ran into, and any time there was a problem, like the guest next door to the room were like, what's going on? <laughs> Uh, and they were like, you know, they solved the problem by offering them free tickets. Um, and, then, and then just deciding that they would leave that room open for us instead. Um, you know, we were also smart about it, just to make sure we were doing a show at a low time for them, we were of value to them. Uh, and we made sure that we, you know, our people loved them. You know? and so that, but it, it felt like a very good thing. And so, you know, it was the right piece at the right place at the right time, which I've learned that's not what happened. They were up for it, and we were up for it, but it was one of those shows that maybe if you'd known what was going to be involved, you would never have gotten to do it. <laughs> um, I have a rather schizophrenic approach to this question, uh, because I sometimes feel like I am my own institutional collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> I you know, have spent more than 20 years working in large not for profit theaters, and then now for the last year I've been an independent operator, and so I'm really what collaboration means from any perspective. Um, and I, I have been debating about which anecdote to share because I have international collaboration, like regional theater, regional theater collaborations, regional theater and commercial. Um, but I think the one I'm going to tell is when I, my last season at McCarter, it's producing director of the invited uh, the Fiasco Theater Company, which is an ensemble based company, uh, to come and create a new piece of big class from the event. If I need a piece, I don't need to play, I need a new production. And um, they, Fiasco, if you're not familiar with this work, is not the novel, it's after Woody 
begin the ensemble, um, having all the directors, who they, um, in this case, it was Noah Brody and Ben Steinfeld, who were both actors in the ensemble and co-directors, and together decided that what they really wanted to do was go back and look at Sarkheim of Ohio into the woods. Prior to that point, the actors were really focused on classical material, really primarily Shakespeare. They're all uh, actors who were graduates in some form or another of BFA or MFA in Brown, and kind of got together for the company. And worked independently. I had heard through great time that they wanted to do this um, Sondheim collaboration, a uh, Sondheim exploration. And so we invited them to come out of the Carter offices with the idea that together, we could create something far greater than we could possibly create in the family. And it was, the, it was, for me, one of the most successful collaborations because it wasn't just about resource sharing um, or you know, kind of an opportunistic collaboration, but really it was about how do we each get the best out of each other. And I have to say, I'm really quite proud of the artistic result, um, which was a, a new way of looking at a, a sort of canonical contemporary musical that many people felt like they finally understood the show for the first time because there was so much time spent on examining the text and really understanding each moment. Um, and then us kind of, I, I feel, raising the their game in terms of how they could take their intellectual work and, and transform it into a really satisfying theatrical experience for an audience. So um, I think Charles and I will answer this question as well. Um, one, of, one of my jobs at the ART as from the director of artistic programs is to think about the relationship between the ART and Harvard University. And I think as Charles and I started thinking about this panel, we started thinking about institutional collaborations as between theater and theater, between theaters and universities, um, between um, theaters and commercial entities as well. So I just wanted to take a minute to talk about what I think for me has been one of the most successful inter-institutional collaborations I've been involved with, which is the relationship between the ART and Harvard. And I'll go back a little bit and just say that when Diane Paulus became the artistic director of the ART five years ago, she was really focused on thinking about that relationship. The ART is part of Harvard University, but thinking more deeply about the ways that the ART could take full advantage of the resources of the, um, of, of the university. I don't mean really financial resources, I mean more like intellectual resources. And so a lot of my time over the last four years has been spent um, engaging artists with professors around the university and vice versa. And I think that's taken two forms. One is probably something that's really familiar to us, which is involving professors in pre-performance events and post-performance events that we do at, 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 at the NRT. And uh, just to give an example of that, we recently did a production of a new musical called Witness to Rhonda, where we built in a post-performance discussion into the performance itself. It was called Act Three. And we were able to draw from Harvard's sort of vast network of experts from the medical school, from the Committee on African Studies to come speak um, in, in, in with the two creators of the show, of the show Matt Gould and Ricky Matthews. And I think, you know, years ago, Diane said something that really made sense to me, which is that the ART could be a catalyst for discussion all around the university, not just in a couple of departments. And I think for many years we have been, you know, focusing on a couple of departments around the university. And what's been great over the last couple of years is that we've really widened our approach, approach and thought about how we can work with the Beast Institute, the Biologically Inspired Engineering, the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, on the various different projects that we're um, staging. And I think the other thing that's been a, a sort of breakthrough for us is the idea of developing work over a longer period of time and thinking about the ways that professors from the university could be involved in the generation and the creation of work before the show is staged. So not just coming in at the end of the show and doing a post-performance discussion. And to give an example, we did a series of roundtable discussions over the last two and a half seasons related to the Civil War. And we brought artists to the table, we brought professors to the table, and usually there was just a theme. Um, the first theme was Uncle Tom's Cabin, the second theme was the soldier's body and weaponry, and the third theme was how we captured and remembered the Civil War with a focus on painting, um, memoir, and photography, collaborated with the Harvard Art Museum on that. And that 
that's been a three-year process. Um, and what we've seen happen is that um, professors at the university felt like they had some kind of voice in the development of the project and something at stake in the development of the project. So much so that one professor actually decided that instead of writing a book, he wanted to write a play um, <laughs> about four periods from the, from the 19th century and we're collaborating on this new project with um, uh, Professor Timothy McCarthy. So I just wanted to, to raise that as another kind of institutional collaboration, the collaboration between the theater and the university. When I think about an interinstitutional collaboration, this is really change my home institution, the Huntington, think about the work we did with a company called the Goldust Orphans. Um, they are uh, the brainchild and baby of Matt Junior's Ryan Landry. I don't know if people are familiar with Ryan's work. He um, got the start of his career working with Charles Ludlum's Ridiculous Theater Company in New York and then moved to Boston and Provincetown and produces two or three shows a year. Um, uh, mainly in the basement of a leather bar over in the Fenway, which he has uh, lovingly rechristened the Ramrod Center for the Performing Arts. <laughs> um, our artistic director, Peter Dupont, really wanted to work with him. Our uh, director of the work, Lisa Toll, really wanted to work with him. Uh, she invited him to be part of our Plankton Playwriting Fellows program. And the program was not a great fit for him. And we then did a stage reading of a play that he was working on at the time. And the stage reading format was a really bad fit for his work. Um, and so then we decided we were going to do this one day only performance of uh, actually as part of University of America, an interinstitutional collaboration between the Huntington AOT and the ICA, the Institute of Disciplinary Air here in Boston. Um, uh, this show he had written called Sight, which was a parody of Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho through the lens of Norman Bates' mother, um, which was uh, a, a drag role played by a local actor and playwright, uh, Larry Cohen. And, um, but it was really them sort of tormenting each other and all sort of like no exit. Um, and it was fantastic, it was hilarious, it was disturbing, at least 40% of my job as a dramaturg was squirting the audience with water guns during the shower scene. Um, but it also led us to program him in our main stage season the following year as a playwright. Um, so it, 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 I think it really changed the way we thought about our, our own work in terms of incorporating non-naturalistic work into our aesthetic. And it changed our working processes in terms of um, the way we interface with writers and the way we look at our relationships. So that, um, Mara used the word schizophrenic, and the panel is a little bit schizophrenic in the sense that we all come at it from intensely different angles, and we all have 18 more examples of uh, interinstitutional collaborations. But I think we want to sort of shift the, the conversation now a bit more towards um, the how and the why, the why we choose to partner with other people, and um, how we enter into that conversation. So. I'll ask the panel, and whoever wants to jump in. Uh, when do you know you need a partner? When do you know you have projects that you can't do by yourself? And uh, what? How do you how do you start thinking about finding that person that can uh, unlock something new for your organization or uh, make a new opportunity? Um, I'm going to give two answers, one with my independent hat on and one with my institutional hat on. Uh, with my independent hat on, I have to say I always need a partner. So now, I don't do anything without thinking about what's the partnership model for this particular piece of work or this artist or this idea. Um, and the partners might be a variety of presenting institutions, it might be uh, uh, board theaters, it might be commercial producers, but you know, what I'm trying to do, and one of the reasons why I decided to become independent is because I wanted to find an alternative model for making work that wasn't necessarily about a single institution making a show that lives only in that institution for only that audience. It's much more interested in finding work that kind of moves and lives in a much larger system. Um, with my institutional hat on, because that's actually the majority of my career, I would say that the most successful by and large, our most successful productions have been partnerships in some way. That the work that you're imagining, whether it's some, 
something that you seeded and commissioned and started, or whether it's something that you're sharing because the artist has a pursuit, or, or you, you need it for economic reasons, or another theater has a pursuit, or whatever, that the moment you start to think outside of your own institution as you're creating work, I think the more likely it is that that piece is going to resonate beyond your institution. And for me, that's what, what marks a successful um, You know, I actually feel very similarly. Um, there's not, I don't program anything that comes out uh, without thinking we would like a partner. Part of that is because you know we're a small company, so any help helps. It's part of it. Uh, the other part of it is that we intentionally try to. One of our core values is to program things that's impossible for us. Um, so then any help really helps. Uh, and the other piece is um, you know it's, it's about we do reach more audiences that way. We do have more resources that way. But we also have more ideas that way. So. Kind of bottom line, it's, it's why I do theater, and I'm not a painter, I guess, or right. Like I, this is why we do it um, to connect and to create relationship and find out what's next because of those connections. Directing it, 
and they <coughs> need to see if there's a way we can work together. Sometimes it shows that we've done uh, last night, you know, what a bird that was on and wanted to see that play again. And so there was definitely no commercial interest in that show until um, it worked out. And then there was a lot of commercial interest in it. So I think that I know it's a it's something that worries some people. Uh, I, I haven't found it as worrying as other people do, and I think that's because of my experience in London is so different, where it's perceived that the relationship between commercial theater, subsidized theater, and fringe theater, which would be defined by where people that mostly get paid, um, is that that's a very healthy ecology and that people feed each other and they work off of it. Uh, it's, you know, in Britain, equity is a different sort of institution. You don't have to, there's no such thing as equity or non-equity, there's just shows. And so you don't have, you know, actors are able to decide that they want to work on the fringe and not get a salary, and they're able to, you know, happily work at the John Long in the court, and work in the movie, maybe get lucky and work on the West End and make loads of money in order to subsidize all that other work. So I think that it, it's just perceived that we all need each other. And I know that there's more of an anxiety about it, or I've met that in my experience here in the past few years. Um, and, you know, I understand that theaters, some theaters, whatever, become dependent on it. But, you know, because of the stuff we've done in the past few years, lots of stuff gets sent to the ART. Um, and, I'm sure they're great projects, but they just would never be the projects we would do. And the magic word isn't, I have all the money. It, it's not, you know, a, the magic word is, this is the best piece of work you can do right now. So I think that's how it's worked for us. Yeah. Uh, similarly, I think that, I mean, I, when we talk about relationships between commercial producers and not for profit, I feel like there's two strands. Right there's the strand that I think Diane is talking about and has also been my experience where the relationships are really driven by the work itself. And when a, when a piece seems to, whether by plan or luck, want to have a future life that is more commercial than not-for-profit, and pass it. And, and in our experience of a partner, that was, that was always the story. We never had a partner going into a play. A partnership always came out, you know, and not for lack of trying to see, we would, I, it, my favorite example was when we were doing it in the tropics and had announced we were going to open our new theater with this new play that nobody had heard of. And I had tried getting everybody to read it and look at it. And then about a month before we opened it, won a Pulitzer Prize. And suddenly everybody was calling me and saying, when, how can I get a look at that plan? I said, well, actually, I sent it to you four months ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, but, but for all of the shows that that transfer, they all happen after the fact. And again, because people just recall the people on the stage. I think where the relationship gets in trouble is when it gets built into the economic model of an institution. That they have to have a certain number of enhanced productions in any given year in order to make those budgets. And that, I think, is where the tension arises and why so many people are kind of after these not-for-profit to commercial transfers. But to me, though, these are two very different kinds of examples. Um, one driven by budget balancing and one driven by the needs of a particular work. Um, we've been sort of uh, talking around the concept of dramaturgy or talking about it and not naming it as such. Um, but I think uh, all of you, A, I think we should claim as dramaturgs, um, building on Vicky's uh, leadership panel this morning. And um, B, I think uh, we all we ask each of you because we think there is a dramaturgical piece at the heart of how you look at the concept of interinstitutional collaboration. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to that and um, how you see uh, both the role of dramaturgs from your institution, people who wear that hat every day, and where you see yourself putting on the dramaturg hat when you're looking at these interinstitutional collaborations, questioning. Uh, they're fit for your institution and how you're going to approach them. Uh, Sean, maybe you can start. So, we are lucky to be a small company that is um, chock full. 
Hold it up. <laughs> and that's really by design. Um, I, you know, it's a skill set. I'm pleased to be included in the ranks, but I, um, part of the reason why I think we uh, have so many drummers on staff is because I, it's a skill set that I really value and hope that I have. Um, but I would say that in terms of the, the collaboration, I mean, I think we, I, my job is to look to connect a lot of times, right, when I program, um, to connect people to people, ideas to ideas, institutions to institutions. Um, and I think a lot of my conversations with um, uh, the folks uh, at Company One have to do with connecting. Um, so I, I don't know. And we also, we're weird. We operate as a collective too. So it's everybody is involved in that process. Uh, you know, we're doing a, we did the lab entrance of Chat Deity, and you know, one of our partners was the Killer Kowalski School of Wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird thing. <laughs> and then we do a BB Kapil's Love Person, and we partner with Beth Inc. Uh, right, that was um, uh, the I saw there. Um, so it's, it's kind of, we think about it like at the beginning, you know, like, and so and drama starts are kind of, uh, uh, half of my program committee, and so it's, it really is just at the base of everything. And so therefore, when it, when it happens, it's actually now it's weird when it doesn't happen. Uh, now I feel like, oh man, I've got a project coming up, and I don't have a major partner on it. I don't have a community partner on it. I don't have, a, you know, um, lucky enough to work at, you know, a Suffolk University or a, a Huntington on it. And it's like, what, you know, how are we going to frame this to make it, uh, you know, either look great or how are we going to find a resource or a community around this? So, um, yeah. does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, uh, both of the collaborations that we've done recently between the Heinz and Company One have come out of dramaturgy and out of enthusiasm for a particular playwright. I don't know if you want to talk about uh, either of those. And, um, uh, yeah, so we, um, Charles Clark, you know, we did, um, we were all, we were part of the Annie, Annie Baker, Shirley Vermont Play Festival here in Boston. Was that in 2010? Like that. Years ago. Um, and so, that's something about, um, when Peter came to town, and, or, you know, Diane came to town, everybody wanted meetings with these people, right? Um, and I was lucky enough that Peter took one with me. And so, I said, hey, how about, we partner with a couple of uh, companies, and we do Tara Up in the Crane's Brother Sister Trilogy. And he kindly smiled, and that didn't work out. So that's an example of a project that we produced by ourselves that we had no right to doing because it was a large project for us, and it was a great project for us. But to his credit, um, he did call back and said, I have another playwright, uh, and I'd love to talk about that. And so um, that was a, also a strange collaboration. Uh, three companies of very, very different sizes trying to make sense of one another. I, I don't know what it was like for you all. Um, and we had the benefit, actually, of Charles um, kind of being the, really felt to me like the one of the core connecting pieces dramaturgically. Uh, I really relied on Charles. We had another dramaturg in our room, Comp, that was a company, one dramaturg at the time. But Charles became someone um, who I relied upon to tell me it was one on the other rooms. Um, and to know that, you know, we had a, we shared a costume designer, uh, a set designer, and Charles, I believe. And um, in these plays that were all supposed to take place in the same fictional town, uh, that became a really rich, and in detailed plays, became a really rich and important role. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're kind of moving forward with another project that we've yet to announce uh, that's a very similar model. I'm excited about that too, so. I can, I don't even know if I'm going to Charles. <laughs> um, in the kind of Venn diagram that is dramaturgy and producing, the area of overlap is constantly shifting. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Anyway, so the, the, the overlapping area for me is very fluid. And um, I have several things to say on this topic. One is I have avoided, and this is my, my it's a controversial, I don't know. I have avoided labeling myself as a dramaturg because I find it too limited. Because I feel that dramaturgs, for better or for worse, get pigeonholed. And I'm not interested in being pigeonholed in any way. And, and how I work, how I interact with artists, the work I produce, the institutions I collaborate with. And so I have really avoided that term. Although I have to say, a, a badge I wear very proudly, I was dubbed by Adam Imovar, who is 
now the associate artistic director of Carter, who calls me the Dramara juror. <laughs> <laughs> and that I like very much. Uh, however, uh, I feel like one's role dramaturgically really should shift project to project depending on the relationship or level of trust between the artist, who the collaborators are, and it should be very clear what those roles are and when, you know, I, I look at myself as a producer with a dramaturgical sensibility. That's sort of how I would describe myself. I also work with some really great dramaturgs who have a wonderful producing sensibility. And I think, you know, that they have the same Venn diagram overlap. Um, I also think about myself and my approach to producing, which I think is true for a lot of dramaturgs, in a much more, I use a kind of anthropological framework for how I think about the work. Um, I was trained in anthropology as an undergraduate, and the participant observer paradigm is one that I find very applicable to our work. As, an, as a cultural anthropologist, you're trained to go into a, a culture, to immerse yourself in that culture. You learn the language, you learn the customs, you learn the rituals. But you always have to maintain enough objectivity that you can analyze, that you can study, that you can write about it, that you can figure out what people are saying they do versus actually what they really do. And to me, that's pretty sick, and it's also dramaturgy. And so when I look at, you know, a play is a culture, a production is a culture, an institution is a culture, a collaboration is a culture, a community is a culture, those skills I apply and reapply in every single one of those contexts. And it's very much informs the way I approach what I do. Um, I think that I sort of probably just mostly would echo what Sean and Mara have said. I, because the Royal Court is such a, a theater that's immersed in the writer as the primary artist that I feel like most of my working life was about the literary manager, because I'm not called in England. Um, you know, it's this sort of key collaborator with the artistic director and me. And it was a he most of the time, but you know, she is very young. So he or she would, you know, have the most intense relationship with the writer. But certainly we were all at the table. So I do feel that it's sort of how I think of myself as if somebody could produce, but with a dramaturgical sensibility. Yeah. It's interesting because a lot of um, students in our dramaturgical program have shown interest in producing as well in our graduate program at the ART. So it's something that's very much on my mind. I, know, I believe actually quite strongly that those practices should be integrated. I think producers will be stronger. Will be stronger for understanding producing. I think of the future leadership of the American theater is embodied in those skill sets working together and leaders really being able to have that spectrum of producing ability and artistic creation ability. So, what do you think about the Purdue programs need in terms of training them to, to do that? I think they need, I think that, that you know, when, I mean, when I think about producing and artistic producing and dramaturgy, I think about mission and vision and purpose, understanding not just how to take a play apart or put it together, but why you do what you do, who you're doing it for, what the connection is between the content and the community and the, you know, context in which you're producing it. It's, I just, it's a, for me, I'm interested in a really holistic approach. So I'd have to think a little bit longer about how I would go about it working in a way, but I just think they should learn that they should learn about budgets and they should learn about contracts and they should learn about leadership and management. You know, and how you direct a staff. Like that's how we should be trained about here today. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll ask one or two more questions and then we'll open it up to the audience and take questions from you all. So I think um, we wanted to talk a little bit about collaborating with institutions that are not theaters or universities as well. And that could, one way of asking this is sort of, what's the organization that you've already dreamed of working with but haven't worked? And you know, Gotham Opera jumps to mind. They collaborated with the Museum of Natural History in New York and, and recently with another museum. So. 
I'm curious if any of you have experiences, Sean, you did mention the hotel, and we know it would be a great example. Um, what are organizations that you both, that you dream of collaborating with, or are there other examples of inter-institutional collaborations that we haven't covered yet? I'll take an example. I mean, I have an example, but I have to think about the dreaming one longer. Um, a lot of times when I was in London, um, institutions, um, often medical or um, researchy or. Oh, no, I never heard of what I'm talking about. Okay, anyway, what I was going to say is they would come to us and they would say, we will pay for a commission for a writer if you will find somebody who will write on this subject. So we gladly took their money for um, for writers. Okay. Sorry, this is so funny. Okay, so the one that is sort of interesting that was unexpected was that about ten years ago, the Climate Change Center, only it's not quite called that, at Oxford University, decided that um, they would have a conference where thirty scientists would meet with thirty artists because they said, climate change is happening, nobody believes us, we have the evidence, and we're not very good at communicating the message. So we've you know, looked around the world and we think arts are the way that messages can get out. Now, that's not working that well yet, but um, it led to an organization that's called Tipping Point that is, you Google it, it's really fascinating, but it, it definitely was a collaboration that was not artist originated, but now is very much artist, whatever, and scientist together. And that was extraordinary. And I hope some of really great, I hope some plays will come out of it, but I hope other things will come out of it as well. Um, because obviously it's the most pressing issue of our time. But uh, and that was something totally unanticipated. And now people routinely go to the Arctic and for um, a project that I'm actually working on right now that both, I think, addresses other models of interinstitutional collaboration and also this idea of artists and scientists. I'm working with a really interesting company right now called Phantom Limb. They're a New York-based company um, founded by a woman, Jessica Breinstaff, who's a visual artist and designer, and Eric Finko, who's a composer and puppet designer. And again, people who kind of have transformed their own identities and they, have, they are in the midst of creating a trilogy of pieces that deal with climate change and humanity. And the second piece of that trilogy is called Memory Rings, and that's the piece that I'm like producing with them. Um, and it's a really interesting challenge on a number of levels. Just to get into the climate change thing for a second, um, I think it, you know this notion of in interinstitutional collaboration between artists and scientists is really important. Because as artists, um, and this is one of the things that uh, we talk about a lot in Phantom Limb when we talk about the ballet and its pieces, this is a piece that is created with visuals and movement and music and puppets. All the storytelling is nonverbal. There's no text. And part of that is strategic on their part, because particularly when you're taking on an issue like climate change, people get harangued all the time by statistics. And reason clearly doesn't in terms of trying to persuade a populace to change its behavior. It just doesn't. And if you guys have ever, I'm trying to remember, there's a, there's a book about this that talks about people's decision making where it's like 90% emotional and 10% reason. Or whatever it is. Anyway, um, uh, so reason doesn't work. So how can we as artists somehow appeal to people's subconscious, and I think it's through beauty and poetry and imagery and music, that we can hopefully stir them enough and awaken them enough that it, it changes, you know, their their tuning and their sensitivity, and so they respond differently to things the next time they are confronted with them. That's the hope, and I think that's the place where collaborations between artists, whether it's artists and scientists, or artists and whatever, or artists and politicians, artists and activists, activist artists. That there's there's all kinds of examples I think, of where we're moving forward, where I feel like those kinds of collaborations, along with them getting the traditional producing or presenting 
infrastructure involved to get that work out and moving through communities to me is my fantasy about where we're going. Um, in the case of Phantom Limb, it's been really challenging. So I know I no longer have an institution behind me. I'm an independent producer. These are independent artists. We're trying to make work outside the confines of a traditional institutional structure, and yet we want the work to be presented in what will look like traditional institutional structures because it's a theater piece that's going to have lights and projections and costumes and sets. And so it will look like it belongs in a building. Um, but it's being made by cobbling together the interest and support of many institutions, each of whom recognize the value of this work. There's a high risk factor in this work. It's, a, it's kind of pushing the envelope aesthetically. It's not going to be for mainstream audiences. Um, it's going to be for people who are willing to supply as much of the narrative as the artists supply when they come to see the work. Um, and so we had you know, a residency at the Rauschenberg Foundation in Florida where we did a preliminary workshop on our piece. Because this is also a devised piece, so it's, it's about creating it on bodies, not in a room with a pen and paper. Um, and now we're going to a brand new contemporary performance venue in Nashville called Oz this coming July for a two week residency to continue to build the work and more discussion with two other actually university based presenting organizations about finishing the development. Each of these little places, nobody has ownership of it. There's no claim, there's no subsidiary rights. These are all institutions who are each taking a little piece of the puzzle and hopefully some funders taking a little piece of the puzzle to build a piece that then will tour to SPAN and UCLA and hopefully a lot of other things once I'm done booking it. So that's my current and future hope. We're lucky at Company One that, that our audience demographics are relative to the nation look a lot like the city of Boston. Um, I think that's my dream and maybe nightmare has to do with um, one day having a formal partnership with the city. Um, I say nightmare for those of you who might be new to town, uh, only because um, the city's changing. Uh, we have uh, new elected officials and uh, new position in the arts, so I don't actually know what that better, you know, what that would mean yet. Uh, but I feel like we appreciate theater for the people. Uh, we appreciate theater that is uh, on a lower shelf, accessible, uh, even if it's uh, high shelf theater. And uh, I think working with the city might be uh, might be a good thing for us. Um, not a theater collaboration, uh, not an educational collaboration, but one that's really important that we should probably say about our residencies. Um, and we are residents of the Boston Center for the Arts, uh, which has been really valuable for us. Um, and it's not, a, it's not necessarily a resource that gives us any money, uh, gives us discounts on space and things to that effect. But, um, and that somehow, some way, once upon a time, I guess, came through the city, uh, the Boston Center for the Arts did. Um, but having residents for a small company is a big deal, and I think, you know, uh, we do have a home, and that means a lot. Uh, we've been there for a long time, so uh, that's an example of one that I could talk further about. One, one thing really quickly is that we're collaborating programmatically with Boston Center for the Arts to uh, develop work by female playwrights, uh, the Double X Lab. We've been doing that now for three years, um, developing some really wonderful playwrights and brand new work there, and that's something where a non-theatrical, non-education institution stepped up into the system to us, and we think you're able to do that work, and uh, that was meaningful and remains meaningful. Uh, for my dream partner. Okay. I, I'm not sure they're my dream partner, but it, it doesn't relate to dramaturgy. It relates to audiences, which I know we're not supposed to talk about. <laughs> and, uh, one of the things we're talking about a lot at ART right now is how our audience is going to change over the next five to 10 years, and we have a lot of people being on social media who follow us, who probably, maybe will never get to Cambridge, possibly will get to New York if one of our shows still happens to be running there, but they affiliate with the ART, and they write us nice letters, and they like us on various things, and so we're talking a lot about theater audiences in the future, 
the line of that will always be the most primary experience, but just as you can follow up with a, a band and have their poster and create your a fan or know their lyrics or incorporate their work and once in a blue moon see a concert, it, it just the world is changing so much. So I don't know who, because I don't want it to be the devil, but is it Google? I don't know. But I just feel there's something in the way that audiences are changing right now. Look at America finally likes the world. And I feel when I, when I first lived here, nobody watched it. I had to go to one bar in Arlington to see it. And now you can see it everywhere. And I just think that's interesting to us about what's happening with audiences. So we'd love to open for questions from the audience, thoughts about interinstitutional collaborations, provocations, questions. Just have to be really clear up 
front, who's in the lead? You know, you can't have a situation, and I'm, ta I'm talking probably about the most common interinstitutional collaboration right now, which is the co-production, where you've got two theaters, and both of them are advising the creative team of the project. I'll give you a perfect example of a play, this was a number of years ago, I know, that we were producing with the New York Theater Company. And let me tell you, the New York Theater Company assumed they are the alpha, regardless of who's been, who has the longest relationship with the artist, if you're an upcoming year, you're not New York who commissioned the play, it doesn't matter. The New York Theater Company comes in and says, this is they're in charge. So the first thing you have to do is establish whether or not that is actually the case, what that relationship is. In this one case, we had a situation where we were co-producing a production, and the producer from the New York Theater came to the dress rehearsal and said, then there was a meeting afterwards with the director, the producer from the other theater, and myself. And the producer from the other theater said, well, don't spend any time working with that actor because we'll just fire them for the New York production. Really, the things you need to focus on are these. And I just said, um, excuse me, we're mounting a production at this theater for this audience, and we're going to do everything we can to get that actor up to speed because we have four weeks to live with this performance. And wouldn't you know the actor actually stayed in the production <laughs> by the time we were done? But, it, but those are just some of the very real things. You, and you can't anticipate that that's going to happen. So it's really important for the partners to understand, also to say, you know, when it's at your theater, you're in charge. And the other person gets to advise. And then when it goes to their theater, they get to be in charge. And you get to advise. And I think that's a really important and healthy thing to declare and say up front. So we've often been the small dogs uh, in the relationship, and I've come to learn that I like that um, because uh, one of the things we're wrestling with, to be very transparent, is that you know, we've, we've done a ton of collaborations with institutions much larger than us uh, recently, and so you know, not that long ago, uh, we were having a meeting internally where we said, we, you know, maybe we should ask ourselves <laughs> what our value is. Um, what is our value to these institutions? Instead of just feeling incredibly lucky that they're only taking meetings and maybe pay for a lot of things and, uh, and hang out at our parties, like what's the value? Um, and that's uh, really, and that's not to be very specific to our organization where we are at in our growth at 15 years old. Um, but defining our value helps us understand uh, not just what we want, but you know, what might be wanted of us and helps us do things like brand and think about who we are and our mission, where we're going and whether we're being true to that. Um, but all of that is to say that once you've defined your value, I find it's easier to think about relationship, right? So for us, it's not, I think we are most successful when thinking about these not as projects, but as relationships. So when I, you know, I don't think it's accidental that our project, you know, with the Huntington or Usher Vermont plays, became a relationship that we're having another conversation, or that our project with Suffolk University last year, um, when we presented the film there, will become another relationship project this year. Um, these happened because we made lots of mistakes, and both institutions we've talked to talk really openly about those mistakes, but we had great wrap-up meetings. The, the project wasn't over until we talked about it, and it was only when we talked about it that we realized that there was more to be had from this. Right? But it wasn't like that was good or that was bad, that made money, that didn't make money. Uh, we were happy, you know, we, we weren't happy. Um, but what else could be done became a really valuable thing. And we're not, you know, hopefully we're not done with that conversation. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, and then the other thing I would say really directly to that question is all of the things that are hard to do by yourself are also hard to do with other people. Right? So, yeah. In some ways, harder, right? Just, just because there's more resources and more mind doesn't necessarily make it easier. Uh, so, for us, our experience is that, you know, marketing is always hard. It doesn't matter who we're working with. That's hard, especially when you're programming uh, things that are challenging. Right? Um, challenging technical elements are hard, even if you've got lots of money to put towards them. That's hard, you know. So 
I think not pretending that things are become easy simply because more people are thinking about them uh, is not right. Another question? our audience an even stronger sense that they have something that they can say on the investment in the um, One thing I'll say about the audience thing, which goes back to the show of Vermont Festival that we did, and one of the things we're talking a fair amount about as we approach this next collaboration, is this sort of odd thing that happened in the critical responses to the festival, where, um, and I guess it's not odd, because people know that Humana, the Humana Festival often gets treated as a kind of horse race in the reviews that happen. But there was an, a, an odd tendency to compare the productions to one another. 
in a way that was not helpful to the plays and uh, not helpful to the art. And yet, even though that happened a lot in the critical community, we're talking about it, I, I did not experience it on the audience side, where there was actually a much deeper engagement with the work that was on stage because it was contextualized from seeing three plays that came from the same study in a very compressed period of time. So all of this is a, about audience in the sense that um, the way they received it, it is something that we're thinking about as we head to this next one, about how we're going to frame the way we're working together and what the goals are in hopes that we can transition that even just a little bit. Uh, so I think about audience all the time. And that's, you know, for me, it's everything I do is totally connected to, it's not complete until it's in front of an audience. When, when you talk about audience in the context of interinstitutional collaboration, I think a lot of it depends on if you're talking about shared audience among institutions or separate audiences among the institutions. Um, you know, audience, the theater is local, no matter what the larger framework for it might be. And one of the challenges when you're dealing with interinstitutional collaboration where you have separate audiences is that the audiences are different. And the way they look at the work is framed very much by their own um, personal context. And we've certainly had situations where the work might have landed in one way in one community and then got to the other community and not landed, um, save to that production. So, I think if there's a trap one can fall into, which is say, oh my god, they broke box office record at that theater. We're going to have no problem selling that show at our theater. That's, that's actually not how it worked out. Uh, so there are real challenges and, and, and assumptions that get made that are false assumptions that, that are part of the trust of this conversation. Uh, hi, uh, Brian Quirk from Night Swimming Theater in Toronto. And I, I wanted to ask a question about um, uh, partnership versus collaboration. And, and we tend to use the two um, uh, uh, in exactly the same way, and I, I don't think they oft, often they are not. I mean, at Night Swimming, we partner with other organizations all the time, but not all of those partnerships are collaborations by any means. Uh, and in my other world, I'm uh, the director of the Banff Playwrights Colony at the Banff Center. And as an example, we're just about to embark on partnership with Cape Farewell, speaking to the environmental uh, partnerships that, that you mentioned, both of you mentioned earlier. Again, a, a similar organization that brings artists and scientists together. It has a lot of potential connection with the Banff Center, which does some of the same things. And we're looking at a partnership around a, a new play by um, Brian and Avery, uh, who went on a Cape Farewell trip into the North Sea uh, through Ruth Little, which is my connection with her, uh, with the project uh, from Dramaturg to Dramaturg. Um, so at the, we're at the beginning of that being a partnership. Whether it'll be a collaboration between the institutions, I don't know. And will it be a collaboration between myself and Ruth and Brian? Probably yes. And so uh, as I um, embark on that uh, adventure, I'm curious uh, how you, uh, whether you make a differentiation between those two things and, and when and how, because uh, everything starts as a partner, well, it can start as either, but one might become the other, and, and sometimes having that conversation too late, I assume, is not so great. I'd love to hear you speak to that that moment or those moments. Yeah, I mean, um, I think a lot of that actually comes back to Brown Kirk's uh, in the respective institutions and how they talk to each other. Um, to sort of use a metaphor, um, often when we're approaching a collaboration or a partnership, the way that I, I, mean, I don't know that I would, once you define the words for me as being different, um, there are some uh, partnerships that feel like a baton pass and some collaborations that feel like a three-legged race <laughs> based on how closely I'm working with that dramaturg at that other theater. And so that to me is the big difference between whether it's a financial partnership collaboration. That would be how I <coughs> <laughs> I agree that it's really funny because there's a project that we're working on now that's kind of a two or three year project with the ARTs. 
definitely a collaborator on. And I always say when we get stuck, if we only had these little, because she was the she who was the literary director at the court when I was there. So lucky you. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we learn from the things that don't work out, and I had a recent experience that started out as a collaboration, and as it evolved, it was clear that some of the artists really just wanted a partnership. Um, and so we actually ended up parting ways because the, the impulse to actually create a collaboration, which was the seed of this particular piece, clearly shifted for some people at some point along the way. Um, and it's sort of, and it's related back to Megan's initial question, which is, you have to be really transparent from the beginning about what your intentions are. And if collaboration is the goal, then that needs to be stated up front. It's, I mean, and it's not to say that you can't evolve into a collaboration. It's much easier to evolve unintentionally in that direction than in the other direction. But again, I think it's about just naming what your expectations are and, and being clear about it. Um, and being honest with yourself about what your expectations are. I think a lot of people um, don't, are, are afraid to say the thing that that is the more negative interpretation because they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But sometimes you actually have to be brave and say it out loud. Otherwise, you'll actually end up with more misunderstanding. And, 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 you know. is, is there something you would have done differently in that example that might have alleviated that? It's really complicated, so I don't know. Um, I think that given the personalities of the people, in, now that I know what I know, if yes, if I were to do it over again, I think I would have, there, there was a key collaborator, the director of this project, who I think was not honest with herself about what she really wanted out of the project. And it was actually clear to me before it was clear to her. And I was the one who said it out loud to her. I think actually, based on the things you're saying and doing, what you really want is to do it this way, which is not actually how we're working. So instead of all of us going in this direction and feeling, and then being unhappy because nobody got what they wanted, let's just stop and pause. And you go ahead and you make the piece you want to make that goes that way. And then I'll go make the piece I want to make that goes that way. And maybe someday they'll come together and there'll be a festival where both the pieces will be there at the same time. And that's actually, that's actually what we're doing. We, we have gone off to make separate pieces that started from the same kernel because we were working in very different ways. Thanks, great example. I would just also add that one thing I've learned is institutions not willing to have the conversations um, for whatever reason. They don't have the time, they don't have the resource, they don't have the capacity, uh, they don't need to do it. Um, usually tells me a lot about how we're going to, what the terminology is going to be around the piece uh, or the, the project. Um, so I think, I, this is great, I love listening to this, um, but I also just like, it is what it looks like a lot of times is what I'm hearing. Yes. And, uh, and, it, it, and I think I've learned that, like it just about always is what it looks and sounds like. And that's okay, as long as everybody's saying it. <laughs> and, and forget the cliche, if you see something, say something. <laughs> <laughs> I think a couple more questions. So, first of all, yes, it happens here all the time. Um, you know, I, I think from a very kind of surface level, uh, there's lots of examples that pop to mind. I know that's that in the Garage series, and lots of um, lots of things. But 
One place that in locally is doing things like this is uh, Art Emerson, uh, who recently, uh, so here's a, a, a small guy, Peter's story. Uh, we uh, were able to get a meeting with Art Emerson, which felt like a big deal. We were going to pitch them this, you know, the most sexy projects I could think of because they do international work and it's, you know, the world on stage and, um, and we wanted to do some risky stuff that we didn't think we had the resources to support. Uh, and after the meeting with like people like David Dower uh, and Rob Orchard, who are, um, I you know, I've come to learn, really generous and gracious. And um, I think the ego thing is core to, to who you want to be with and spending time with. Um, it, it was more about like, hey, you know, uh, we're interested in you. What do you want to do? We're going to make it possible, and we're going to make it possible so we don't lose our shirts doing it. Um, and it was the, you know, from that standpoint, we were kind of absorbed into that. We, uh, the negative part of it, and if we're to do it again, we hope to, is we think we lost a lot of our identity um, through that production. Uh, and I say that in a positive way because we learned a lot about that. Uh, an institution of that size, how do you do that? And how do you, uh, how do you keep your identity and not harm the identity of the institutions being uh, gracious enough to be there. And back to my value question, uh, what are these folks value that us as an important people think about? But there are examples of this. This is one small. I was thinking about when I worked at the National, um, and we did it, but maybe it's more of a European theater model. Because when I was at the National, we adopted a company called Comfort Day, which was very successful now. And Cheek by Jowl and another company that didn't like the Chuck Lorre exclusion. Um, <laughs> we, uh, at, at ART, we only do five or six shows a year because we don't have a very big facility. But we do have a club theater that um, has been an incubator for many local artists in the past five years. But in the past year, we did begin artists in residence program. It's more companies in res residence. And so three local companies now have their home there, and we give them a single thing. But I don't know that their work yet beats the work on our main stages more that we think it's exciting and we want to support them and work with them. So eventually, we're on the show. What's what's the case? Like the Greater knowledge of the local scene, um, a vibrant second stage, which is very important to us because we are an institution and we don't want to just become more run in any way. Um, a chance to work with young local people. Um, I think that's what really my example that answers that question. This is an ensemble company, self-sustaining, that we brought into our own company. And um, I mean, I think what we got out of it at McCarter was a really exciting and innovative way of looking at a piece of material that we would never have approached that way on our own. Um, the, the challenges were because they were their own company. Um, you know, they did, they spoke their own language, they had their own <coughs> rituals, and merging the two cultures of these organizations to have a successful collaboration. Um, we spent a lot of time over meals, as I said, food is always my number one strategy, um, to kind of break that down and figure out how we were going to do that without having lots of conflict. Because there could easily have been conflict. It's a you know, large budget institution, a small budget ensemble, it would be very easy for them power dynamic to be out of bounds. Um, I would actually say, if anything, what ended up happening was that the success of the production was so terrific, um, it actually fiasco of the little ensemble probably eclipsed McCarter, the big institution, 
in terms of the success and the notoriety of that particular piece as to the outside world. Uh, but our audiences want further collaboration and have been wondering when is this company going to come back to the theater? Okay, uh, I think we have time for maybe one, one more question. Anyone? Yes, last one right there. Uh, Scott Horstein from Sonoma State. Just a follow up to Mara, what you were saying before about dramaturgs as sort of the next generation of theater managers and so forth. I'd, I'd be interested to hear you talk a little further than anyone talk, just in terms of training, right? You were saying, well, in addition to uh, dramaturgy courses, you know, why not be taking, learning about budgets and management and so forth. Of course, there are management programs as well, and usually internships and apprenticeships tend to pull the two apart. I'm sure there are programs that have good dovetailing between the two disciplines. Um, I'm not aware of them myself, but I'd just be curious to hear you talk a little bit more about how that intersection might might work in terms of training both in schools and also people apprenticing professionally. And comments from the other two panelists as well. I feel like there has been this slow, uh, unspoken progression towards this notion of creative producing, taking a more dominant role in the field. Band, myself, there are certainly other people out there who may label it different things, but it is this notion that you know we we've inherited a model in the American theater, the managing director, artistic director model that is really born out of a marital relationship between two people at a particular theater <laughs> that became the model for the rest of us to follow, <laughs> and the dysfunction or function of that marriage. It's not necessarily the best thing for all of the theaters around the country. Um, so, and getting people to dispel the notion that this is the only way, that having this two-headed monster is the way that artistic organizations should run. No other artistic field does this, except for the theater. To me, I think it's completely baffling. We have trained ourselves to um, patronize people who are creative and say that they are not capable actually of managing a large <coughs> um, And the creative people have accepted that. And I feel like the shift that needs to happen is to say that you can actually use your left brain. It's not, and this isn't true of everybody. Not everybody is meant to do this. So it's not a one-size-fits-all model. But the idea that it is possible to have a part of your brain that understands artistic process, that understands how to tell a story, how to engage with an audience, how to deliver a performance, but that can also understand how to look at a balance sheet. They, you don't have to be an accountant to understand when the financial model is working and when it's not. And there are lots of people you can call in to support you, to help you pick that apart and begin to maybe come up with other structures or other models for how to do so in terms of training, I feel like we've, side, we've, we've, we've created these silos. You can train to be a manager, or you can train to be an artist. And what I would love to do is train artistic leaders so that they can really move fluidly, depending on who they are and their particular skill set, and then to be able to understand and identify and, and feel comfortable saying, here are the skills I lack, and therefore these are the kinds of people I'm going to surround myself with and that's going to be my leadership model. And over here, it's going to be this other person. They're going to have strength in this area. And because they have been trained and understand the skills that are required, they will understand what they lack and then support themselves in whatever way makes sense for who they are. So that instead of having a model that gets replicated, we have lots of institutions understanding that you build leadership around an individual. Um, the other challenge of this, besides the training, is training our boards, and training our boards to understand that there is more than one way to structure an organization. <laughs> and the problem we also, the other problem we have, this is like a whole other topic, <laughs> but this is my soapbox, sorry, go. Um, is that, again, unique, I think, in the performing arts to other fields in which not-for-profit organizations have boards of directors who are responsible for their governance. In our field, Generally speaking, the people who are responsible for the governance of these institutions have no immediate knowledge of actually how to run those institutions. And so what do they do? They look around and see what everybody else is doing. 
because that's what you do. You do research, you see what's happening in the field, and then you replicate what seems to be the best practices. And so we just keep repeating the problem over and over and over again because we're building models instead of institutions that are based on that people that are having them. Yeah, I think in a really small way, in our small corner of the world, we try to do just that, right? So how can we just change the model? I think that's the bottom line because, so, you know, our apprentice programs for like high school age people, that are you know artistic apprenticeship programs. We partner with Citizens Bank on financial management, you know, um, which is like they would throw with us. They have no idea they want to do with these in that sort of range. But these like young people uh, who dream big and maybe very talented, right? May not have any sense of what does this actually mean. And then in a very different way, similarly, maybe more relevant to this room, um, our dramaturgs sit around our staff table um, and are responsible not to be. Um, dare I say, quiet librarian types. Um, they're responsible to have an opinion on everything. Uh, everything. And though I wouldn't say necessarily anyone is in line uh, specifically to be a producer, I think everyone, when they come in, uh, I think everyone upon leaving our staff um, could certainly consider themselves a producer. Um, because your job is to be holistic in your approach, I think, of, of the thing. And those are the people I want to work with. Like, I want to work with people who are big picture. I want to work with people who understand. Like, you, you, how are you going to create a problem solver on money if you don't understand it? You know? Uh, so. I guess I want to say. Uh, this is like my dirty little secret. Uh, okay. Uh, this is one of them. I, when I first started professionally in this field, I got an internship. The internship was in management. In that first internship, I learned how to make budgets, how to negotiate contracts, how to make people's travel arrangements. And then at night, I was the house manager, and I saw all the shows I could see, and I met all the artists, and I cleaned the toilets, and I did everything. Um, and then it was a three-month internship, and when it was over, a position opened up in the artistic staff at the theater, and it was just one of the things that somebody had been let go quite suddenly, and they looked around, and they said, hey, you, you're not doing anything. Will you cover this job for a month while we search for this person's replacement? And I was able to make the leap from the management side to the artistic side without anybody noticing. <laughs> this was in 1990. And let me tell you, in 1990, you couldn't cross over from management to artistic. Once you were in one, you were pigeonholed for life. And that training I got, doing those budgets, negotiating those contracts, the, the person who was mentoring me made me memorize the Actors Equity Handbook. I have to tell you, that is some of the best training I have ever had. That, those skills, every day come into play. And so, and when we talk about training, I, I wasn't kidding, like budgets, contracts, so useful, even if it's not your, your duties every day. You need to understand all of the elements of the business in order to focus on the thing. And wrapping up, I will actually call out Julie Dugner as um, <laughs> an example of marriage as an effective uh, institutional uh, model where she would frequently say, uh, because of her husband, that she spoke sound. And that that <laughs> inevitably had an effect on that, exactly that kind of collaboration. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you to our panel. Thank you uh, to all of you for your smart questions. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs>
in your area over the next year. So just a couple quick things. Uh, it will probably be easier since we're larger groups uh, if you have cash, that's awesome. Uh, and you're going to follow your regional VP to, or, to dinner. So I'm going to point them out to you right now and remind you where those dinners are before we get going. If you did not register um, when you registered for the conference for dinner, that's okay. See me. We'll make sure you can still go to dinner with everyone. That's not a big deal. Uh, so I'm going to start in reverse because the folks in group six going to Montian have a reservation starting very soon and I guess they're very strict about reservations. So group six uh, is uh, the Rockies area, which is Martine. Um, 